venue. We're in this wonderful historic church, St. Cyprian's Episcopal Church. And it's so appropriate and fitting that we have this program in this church because this church was constructed shortly after the burning of Derry. One of the first churches to be rebuilt in this community after the burning of the town, and it was rebuilt by the freed slaves of the area, chiefly from Butler's Island, the south of here. And this became the African American Episcopal Congregation and their house of worship, which is, it has remained to this day. Wonderful old historic church, one of the most historic churches in coastal Georgia. Thank you all for coming. Most of you are, are accustomed to hearing my programs and lectures with the use of visual aids. As you can tell, I don't have any. So I hope you'll bear with me and not get too. The door is that way if you get bored. <laughs> There's a reason for that. And if you're at the program two weeks ago that I did at the Presbyterian Church, that was about antebellum Darien in McIntosh County where there's a wealth of visual images to use for that period of time in our coastal history. The burning of Darien, which is a very, very streamlined pocket, did not, does not lend itself to images. There are no photographs of the burning. There are very, very few photographs of the participants. And the most anybody ever really heard about the burning of Darien was the movie Glory 20 years ago. So there has not been a lot of historical analysis of this event, documentation or whatnot, until recent scholarship, really with the interest, the renewed interest in the war between the states with the 150th observance. I think in this case, possibly the, probably the best way to, to, to do this is allow the, the end to be the beginning. Quoting, Along the shore were large warehouses of rice and rosin. What rosin we could put aboard, we loaded. Darien contained one fine broad street along the river. It was a beautiful town, and never did it look so grand and so beautiful as in its destruction. The warehouses along the river were fired last, and the burning of them was the signal for our departure. We hurried on board, and well it was for us. It was hot. We could not stay on the side of the boat next to the wharfs. The whole town was one fire from one end to the other. It was a spectacle grand in the extreme. When the rosin in the warehouses took fire, a dense black smoke rolled up and almost shut out the light of the conflagration. Those words were penned by one of the participants, one of the officers of the 54th Massachusetts, Captain Louis Emilio, in his recollection and memoirs of the event. Well, it was one of the most unkind acts of the war as clearly deduced from the, the quotation I just cited from Captain Emilio. It was unkind and it was, it was controversial, remains controversial to the present day. The late Georgia historian E. Merton Coulter provides incontrovertible proof that the destruction of Darien by federal troops on the 11th of June, 1863, was, quote, a barbaric act and one of the best examples of wanton vandalism of the entire war. That's a mouthful considering there are a lot of barbaric acts in that war. But this is the state's eminent historian, the late Professor Coulter, who studied this event probably in an analytical way more than anyone else up to that time in the 1960s. Paradoxically, as significant as this is, to the town's history, the story of Darien's burning on that June day in 1863 is only vaguely familiar to people who have lived here their whole lives despite a proliferation of books and articles and even historic marker on the city, lawn, city hall lawn commemorating the incident. 
The fullest account of the burning of Darien, based on documented research, is by the late historian Spencer B. King of Mercer University, titled Darien, the Death and Rebirth of a Southern Town, published in 1981. There have also been letters and memoirs written by the participants that have been issued in book form in recent years. Probably the best collection of this is uh, Colonel Shaw's letters, which have been issued uh, as, as, a, as an edited book some 20 years ago, which gives a great deal of understanding and interpretation and analyzes the burning of the town from the commander of the 54th. Dr. King, in his book, joined a growing chorus of Southern writers who down through the years have labeled Union Commander Colonel James Montgomery, known as the Kansas Jayhawker, quote, a destructive vandal ranking on a scale somewhere between Hitler and Attila the Hun. <laughs> Pretty strong words. In brief, the facts are these. Early on the morning of June 11th, two Federal Navy gunboats and two Army transports loaded with troops of the 54th Massachusetts and the 2nd South Carolina, both volunteer regiments, departed from their temporary base on the north end of federally occupied St. Simons Island and attacked Darien later the same day. These regiments were composed entirely of black troops with white officers, recruited both in the north and in the south largely for the purpose of staging raids on civilian targets such as Darien. At the time these African-American units were formed, it was initially thought unlikely that they would see direct combat against Confederate forces. There was a twofold reason for this. There was fear of reprisal against the black troops were they to be captured by Confederates, and there was also the concomitant uncertainty of how even trained African-American troops would stand up under the heat and fire of artillery and musket balls during battle. The operation was under the overall command of Montgomery. His immediate subordinate was Colonel Robert G. Shaw, the young 25-year-old commanding officer of the 54th Massachusetts, who had recruited and trained his regiment in Boston. It's important to remember that Darien was a largely deserted town when the four Union gunboats arrived at the bluff in the vicinity of the present Skipper's Fish Camp on the Darien waterfront. There had been Yankee gunboat raids on the local rice plantations the previous year in 1862, and so many of the people of Darien in the immediate area got out, they evacuated. They went to Baysden's Bluff, or they went to the interior, to Waynesville, or to uh, even to the uh, Atlanta area, to places like Marietta, or southwest Georgia. Very, very few people were in Darien. And as I'll point out in a few moments, there were a few people, some of whom felt the, the immediate and direct impact <coughs> of the Union raid. It's also important to remember in this context of Darien being largely deserted that it was also undefended. There were no Confederate forces of any consequence in the Darien area at the time of the attack. So the Union raid was totally unopposed. There was no battle. That, this is a misconception that some people have. Not only do we get visitors to Darien who say, well, uh, how was it when Sherman burned Darien? The, the next question they asked was, was it a big battle? Neither of which is true, obviously. <coughs> so Darien was undefended. Based on these circumstances, it is thus difficult to establish a definitive rationale for the looting and subsequent destruction of, of Darien. This was a new kind of war. You have to understand that after 1815, the end of the Napoleonic Wars with Waterloo, the methodology of fighting had changed gradually over the years, but never so much as in the American Civil War. There had been no major European wars fought after Napoleon was beaten at Waterloo. 
until the Civil War in North America. Consequently, this was the first industrial war, the first war based on technology that had never been used in warfare before. Railroads for the movement of troops and supplies and armaments, repeating rifles, armored warships used for the first time in battle in the American Civil War. The telegraph for communication. The telegraph enhanced communication between commanders in the field and their superiors in headquarters. All of this technology came to be used in the American Civil War for the first time in war. It was a precursor, you might say, a laying of the groundwork for the wars that came 50 years later in Europe with the Great War, later known as World War I. In fact, the period 1861 through 1871 that included the American Civil War and the wars of German unification in Europe totally transformed the way land wars were fought. And as we know, the subsequent progression of military and naval technology evolved into the 20th century into the great conflicts of World Wars I and II and all the wars afterwards. A good argument could be made that the burning of Darien might be labeled as the precursor to the concept of total war as it came to be understood in the wars of the 20th century. And many of these human conflict, human strategic conflict, became much more than simply confrontations between armies on a battlefield or between fleets at sea. Total war entailed the imposition of death and destruction by military assets against civil society in general and civil populations and infrastructure in particular, regardless of whether these actions directly affected the course or outcome of a battle or a war. In the case of Darien, the town had been from 1820 to about 1850, one of the leading ports on the South Atlantic coast for the export of rice, upcountry cotton, timber, might have given it some legitimacy to eliminating it as a viable southern commercial center in the manner of Savannah and Charleston and New Orleans and Mobile and Galveston, which the Union blockade had imposed uh, a, a lot of attention to. But this was not the case at the time of the war between the states. By 1860, the railroads had bypassed dairy and all the upland cotton grown in the interior of Georgia was being shipped by rail to Savannah or Charleston for export. The Panic of 1837 created a severe national depression and that affected Darien directly. The powerful, the once powerful Bank of Darien lost its charter because of the depression and the decline of the cotton business because of railroads. During the 1850s, the town did not recover its commercial preeminence. It was still shipping cotton and some rice and some timber, but not to nearly the degree that it had been at the peak of Darien's commercial prosperity in the 1830s. And just as a sidebar, attesting to the importance of Darien's commercial prosperity in the 1830s was at that time, before the railroads went to Savannah, Darien was shipping more cotton than any other place, not only in Georgia, but anywhere south of Charleston. This was the importance of Darien because of what? The Altamaha River. The Altamaha River. I'm repeating myself from two weeks ago in some instances, but it's important to remember these aspects. The river was the conveyor belt for cotton coming to Darien for shipment. But it became cheaper and more expeditious to ship your cotton 
from Macon and Milledgeville and all the places in between by rail to Savannah. So Derry, at the time of the raid, was not nearly as important. It was not worthy of the attention of being destroyed. <clears throat> the town simply had minimal value in 1863 as an economic, military, or strategic objective. Clues to the rationale behind the destruction of Darien lie in both the personal letters of Colonel Shaw and others gleaned from the official records of the Union and Confederate armies. It is fortunate that Shaw immediately committed his concerns to paper in the aftermath of, of the destruction of Darien because as we all know, Colonel Shaw was killed in action little more than a month after the raid on Darien at Battery Wagner near Charleston. Events vividly depicted, of course, in the movie Glory. By the way, there will be a showing of the movie Glory. Did Steve mention this earlier? We will have a showing of the movie Glory for those interested, for those who have not seen it, to those who want to see it again at the local high school, the McIntosh County Academy, on Thursday night. So uh, I commend that to you. If, even if you've seen it, it's well worth it because the burning of Darien is, is somewhat symbolically at least depicted in, in that movie, although not completely historically accurate. This is a historian talking. <laughs> the movie's great. And it's 95% right, particularly from the military aspect. Colonel Shaw, writing to his wife Annie, the day after the burning, noted, quote, about noon we came in sight of Darien, a beautiful little town. Our artillery peppered it a little as we came up river, and then our boats made fast to the wharves, and we landed our troops. The town was deserted, with the exception of two white women and two Negroes. After the town was pretty thoroughly disemboweled, Montgomery said to me, I shall burn this town. He speaks in a very low tone and has quite a sweet smile when addressing you. I told him I did not want the responsibility of it, and he was only too happy to take it all on his shoulders. So the pretty little place was burnt to the ground, and not a shed remained standing. Montgomery fired the last buildings with his own hand. One of my companies assisted in it because he ordered them out, and I had to obey." End quote. So you see, Shaw is already. Shaw did not have the advance of planning on this. This was something that Shaw was apparently not privy to prior to the raid. Montgomery, of course, was, and I'll get into that in a moment. But we get the feeling that Shaw was quite taken aback by being ordered to burn the town, loot it, then burn it. And he protested it. Shaw continues, quote, You must bear in mind that not a shot had been fired at us from this place. All the inhabitants had fled on our approach. The reasons Montgomery gave me for destroying Darien was that the Southerners must be made to feel that this was a real war and that they were to be swept away by the hand of God like the Jews of old. In theory, it may seem all right to some. But when it comes to being made the instrument of the Lord's vengeance, I myself don't like it. Then Montgomery says, we are outlawed and therefore we are not bound by the rules of regular warfare. That makes it nonetheless revolting to wreak our vengeance on the innocent and the defenseless. No good reason can be given for doing such a thing. Well, let us briefly return to the concept of total war that I alluded to earlier. Most historians argue that the first aspect uh, of total war may have manifested itself with Sherman's march from Atlanta to the sea 
in November, December 1864, 18 months after the burning of Darien. I submit that the concept of total war, at least in the American aspect of it, occurred with the burning of Derry on the 11th of June, 1863. There had been incidents. There were incidents in the American Revolution. There were incidents in the War of 1812. After all, the British did burn part of Washington. But in the conflict of the Civil War, of Americans fighting Americans, for whatever reasons, there had not been anything of this magnitude. Two opposing societies, no compromise, the North and the South. Neither was going to give, neither was going to quit, no compromise. Only by breaking the will and morale of the enemy population could there be any possible compromise. And that was the rationale Montgomery had for burning dairy. <coughs> this was the theory of some Union military leaders. This is how Montgomery got his orders from his superiors. The burning of Darien, therefore, was the precursor to Sherman, who had a whole new idea of the concept of total war, didn't he? The trail of destruction to the sea. That broke the will of the South, at least certainly of the people of Georgia. not the burning of dairy. So then, who was really to blame for this incident? Definitive answers are murky, but apparently the match that lit the blaze that leveled dairy had a fuse going back further than Montgomery. Professor Coulter noted that General David Hunter, commander of Union forces stationed at Hilton Head, from which the 54th Massachusetts and the 2nd South Carolina departed for St. Simons. General Hunter composed a letter to Governor John A. Andrew of Massachusetts that is perhaps more revealing now than it might have been 150 years ago. Hunter wrote to Governor Andrew on June 3rd, eight days before the raid, indicating that the Darien expedition was, quote, but the initial step of a system of operations which will rapidly compel the rebels to lay down their arms and sue for restoration to the Union or to withdraw their slaves into the interior, thus leaving desolate the most fertile and productive of their counties along the seaboard." End quote. This was familiar ground for General Hunter because in 1863, in, in all, most of 1862 even, he had implemented, you know, spotty raids along the Ace Basin rice plantations of South Carolina. Certainly nothing on the magnitude of the burning of dairy, and the, even plantations in McIntosh County and Liberty County and Glen had been attacked by, by raids of Union forces, individual plantations. So Hunter was, was aware of this. This had already been going on to a very smaller degree prior to, prior to dairy. Now we're getting down to some meat and potatoes, and this is important. I want you to listen to me here, because we're getting down to some, some, some documented consequential evidence here. Hunter seems to have had second thoughts about the proposed destruction of dairy. He gave Montgomery somewhat amended instructions on the eve of the departure from Hilton Head. <laughs> Professor Coulter notes, quote, Hunter said that even in light of the Confederate government's attitude toward Negro troops, in order to give the Confederates as little excuse as possible for charging atrocities to the United States, Montgomery should use the utmost strictness, now listen, this is important, should use the utmost strictness 
and avoiding any devastation which does not strike immediately on the material of the armed insurrection which we are now engaged in the task of suppressing. Under further instructs Montgomery, the right of war, though unquestionable in certain extreme cases, is not to be lightly used. All household furniture, libraries, churches, hospitals, you will, of course, spare. Well, this is how history gets misunderstood. I've been in contact with some people this week who have insisted that Montgomery was not the culprit. He was only following orders from his superior and that really Shaw gets, needs to get more blame for the burning of Darien. This is the passions that are driven by this war. Regardless of what side you're on or feel compelled to, to support. We sometimes want to manipulate our historical interpretation to our own personal passions and feelings. Well, based on Hunter's final orders to Montgomery in writing, which are in the Union records, and as subsequent events demonstrate, Montgomery decided to do things his way. He chose to interpret Hunter's revised instructions to conform to his personal views. And he thus looted and destroyed Darien anyway, in clear contradiction of his superior's orders. And this is important. I, I think these revised orders from Hunter are critical to an understanding of why Darien was burned. Hunter and perhaps his superiors said, yep, let's take the war to the people, drive down the southern morale, realize the futility of continuing this conflict, destroy everything in your path. But since they were using African-American troops, Hunter had second thoughts. Hunter thought this might precipitate a backlash by the Confederate forces. It was repellent to him to feel like this would be the, the, the rationale for the burning of a, of, town, of a town by out of control African American Union troops. So he amended his orders to Montgomery and said, spare the churches, spare the buildings of, of, of civic buildings, spare the homes and the businesses. Leave the furniture alone. And as we know, everything of use was taken back on the gunboats and taken back to St. Simon's. So boiling it down to the, to the very essence, Montgomery acted on his own volition. He contradicted Hunter's orders and burned Darien, which had consequences for both he and General Hunter in subsequent months during the war. Some recent research done by the 150th Anniversary Committee has, has revealed some, some important documents on the Gary family. Elizabeth Gary was a free black of color who stayed in Gary with her son Charles and witnessed firsthand the destruction of the town and also the vandalizing of her home and the ransacking of her personal furniture, possessions, materials, cooking items. There's a whole list of them in the documentation. And she implored Montgomery at the time all this was going on, what about my stuff? Who's going to pay me back for this? I'm not at war with the Union Army. And Colonel Montgomery, according to the deposition given by the Gary family, relates that you will be compensated. You will be compensated for all your losses after the war is over and things get settled down. She got compensated. 
$30. So the war came home to Darien and touched even the people who did not have a dog in the hunt directly. Civilians, innocent people. History tells us, based on newspaper accounts and personal records, that the invading troops ransacked virtually all of the houses and business in town, loaded their vessels with their loot, and then put the match to the community. Included were items and materials as disparate as household furniture, books, public records, and documents, farm equipment, crockery, cookware, and all manner of assorted plunder. Well, as the McIntosh County historian, I can attest to that day because the burning of the McIntosh County Courthouse that afternoon destroyed all of our antebellum county records, or virtually all of them. Land deeds, wills, all sorts of documents, public record documents, commission minutes, all went up in smoke or scattered to the winds. And so writing a history of McIntosh County was doubly difficult to ensure proper documentation because of the very dearth of records prior to 1863. And I get emails all the time from colleagues who are doing research on various aspects of this area, whether it's Sapelo or Darien or whatever. So where can I find such and such records? There doesn't seem to be any. I have to email them back and say they weren't. They, they were burned. And then the very few that got re-recorded after 1863, a lot of them were burned because the courthouse burned down again in 1873. Darien, Darien has had a problem with fires. <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> and I can tell you about a whole bunch of other fires this town has endured through the whole panorama of, of its history. Darien was burned as groups primarily comprising the second South Carolina went throughout the town putting the torch to individual structures. The last areas to be set ablaze were the commercial structures and warehouses along the waterfront. Some of these were storage facilities for highly flammable naval stores such as rosin, pitch, and lumber. Essentially all that survived were the exterior walls of the two-story store on the upper bluff later known as the Strain Building, a portion of the Methodist Church, and several other smaller buildings, including the Woodford Mabry House, later known as the Grant House, which still stands at the corner of Rittenhouse Street and Highway 99, only a couple of blocks from where we are right now. Samuel Pelman Boyd, a naval surgeon, attached to one of the Union warships blockading Doughboy Sound, Darien's Harbor, several miles east of town, accompanied the raid on one of the gunboats. In his journal later, Boyer wrote, quoting, at 3 p.m., the Army troops, that is, Colonel Montgomery's regiment, set fire to Darien, and in a short time, short time, the whole place was one mass of flame. The sight was beautiful. Whether it was proper and pat to burn the place, I don't know but I do know that the place was reduced to ashes. We did not ascend the river all the way to Darien on account of our vessel being too large a craft. Consequently, we have nothing to do with the burning of Darien, being merely spectators. <coughs> Darien, Georgia is among the things that was. Those beautiful mills, houses, and stores are no more. All that remains of a once beautiful town is one mass of smoldering ruins, one of the effects of civil war. History has not been especially kind to Colonel Shaw in this Darien affair because, again, of the misinterpretation and the twisting of the documented record. Inexplicably, it was Shaw who for many years was accorded most of the blame for the town's destruction when it was, of course, Montgomery who planned the raid and ultimately decided to completely destroy Darien. Shaw was only carrying out Montgomery's orders and under protest, as we, as we have seen. Shaw, in fact, went on record on the day Darien was burnt that he was against the burning of the town. 
The official records of the Union and Confederate armies compiled by the U.S. government in the 1890s contains correspondence Shaw wrote to his superiors at Hilton Head, attesting to his displeasure with the actions by Montgomery. Shaw disavowed any responsibility for the destruction, noting that it was not very sensible to put the torch to a small, unimportant town which was completely undefended and which offered so little of value in the military regard. Montgomery, on the other hand, in ordering the destruction of Darien, eschewed strategic military sensibilities. He gave in to his personal emotions. This was perhaps understandable considering the political climate from which Montgomery came. Prior to the war, he was embroiled in an atmosphere of constant violence in bloody Kansas over the passionate debate of whether Kansas should be a free or a slave state. Montgomery was hardened and made of ruthless stuff. Because of his strongly abolitionist views, he was a man who espoused little compassion towards southern slave owners and the slaveholding states in general wrote one eyewitness, quote, in the end, nothing was left of Darien. Darien is nothing but a blackened pile of ashes. The invaders even shot the cattle in the streets, left them there. There's not a living soul left in the town, quote. There were repercussions. President Lincoln did not like this scorched earth policy. By the end of June, Lincoln had removed Hunter from command of the Department of the South, and Montgomery was also removed from his command to the Second South Carolina and sent back to Kansas from which he had come. Both officers had inconspicuous, inconspicuous ends to their military careers. Conversely, Shaw, the 54th commanding officer, who had reluctantly obeyed Montgomery's orders, died a hero's death a month after the raid, being killed at Fort Wagner while leading his African-American troops in a grave but futile assault against Confederate artillery emplacements. Shaw came from an aristocratic abolitionist Boston family to which, as we have seen, he fortunately made his feelings known about the Darien incident before his death in battle. After the war, Shaw's mother, Sarah Blake Shaw, provided a generous monetary contribution toward the rebuilding of the St. Andrew's Episcopal Church New Chapel at the Ridge, which preceded by several years the rebuilding of the destroyed Episcopal Church on Vernon Square. This is a sidebar. The present church on Vernon Square was completed in 1879, and the monetary contributions by Mrs. Shaw and other members of her family went toward some, I believe, toward that church, but mainly toward getting a house of worship available for the Episcopal congregation of Derry. The Shaws were, were Episcopalians, and very prominent Episcopalians of, of Boston. And there is considerable surviving correspondence on record between the Reverend Robert Clute and Mrs. Shaw and the senior warden of the church, William R. Genlap, relating to the restoration of worship facilities for the local Episcopalian congregation. This is important to remember because, as we have seen, Shaw wrote his mother and his wife absolving himself and protesting what happened here. And this was Mrs. Shaw's wish to at least help the people of Derry in, in some way for what had happened at Derry, and even though her son was, was, was against it. For the remainder of her life, Mrs. Shaw, the mother, worked to clear the reputation of her son, who had protested the burning of Derry, yet was incorrectly accorded much of the blame by locals for the incident. This was supposedly, as legend has it, I have not been able to ascertain a, a direct source for this, but local legend has it that near the end of the raid, someone involved in the raid wrote the name Shaw in paint on some lumber 
that had survived the blaze. <coughs> like Shaw was here, or Shaw did this. And so for many generations, the people of Derry just assumed that Robert Gould Shaw was, was, the, was the person who burned their town. This was long before we have academic discipline and, and the rigid historical analysis that we are accustomed to now to sift through the facts and, 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 and ascertain the, the correct interpretation of what happened. It actually took several generations for people to have an understanding of what really happened. I remember as a child growing up in McIntosh County, my grandparents and my great-grandparents talking about the burning of Derry and about Shaw. This is just a legacy that was passed down from one generation to the next until the historical ship started to right itself. As to Derry in itself, the story of how the energetic, enterprising little town rose from the ashes of war and made a phenomenal economic recovery is a familiar one. In the immediate aftermath of the war, right after Appomattox, Derry began rebuilding based on the river as it had always gone to the river for its economic and commercial survival and prosperity. Its commercial resurgence was based on a new industrial vigor centered upon the processing and marketing of pine timber rafted down the Altima Hall to the town's newly built sawmills. There are stories that say the people that fought in the Confederate Army, those survived, such as the Hiltons and the Lacklesons and others and the Fosters, came back to Darien and before they built homes and stores and schools, they built sawmills. They had been involved in the timber business prior to the war, and they understand how important the timber business was to Darien, and it was the only way the town was going to recover economically. Build the sawmills and then worry about everything else later. Get the timber flowing down the river again. Get the ships into the harbor loading Darien timber. The town will grow back to its former prosperity. And it did. Between 1875 and 1900, Darien was the leading commercial seaport on the entire Atlantic coast for the shipment of yellow pine timber, shipping timber all over the world into the northeastern United States. The town had come full circle back to its economic prosperity of the 1830s, despite the burning. Darien had become the story of Atlanta in microcosm. Atlanta rebuilt immediately after the war and became the capital not only of Georgia, but also of the South. Darien was the exponential vision of Henry Grady's philosophy of a new resurgent South in which the South needed to evolve from an agriculturally based society to an industrial based society. And Darien reflected that with its timber industry. And then later the railroads came to Darien. We get swept away in, in, in things like the events of the burning of Darien because we sometimes tend to focus on the big picture, the wide, broad sweep of the history of the war between the states. Remember, only three weeks after the burning of Darien, the greatest battle of the war was fought at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Vicksburg fell on the Mississippi two serious blows to the southern cause. And the burning of Darien sort of got swept up in those great consequential military events which changed the course of American history in so many ways. A 
And one of the great tragedies, in closing, I, I would like to remind you to me that one of the great tragedies of, of this is, is, the, is the terrible loss of Colonel Shaw at Charleston on the 18th of July, 1863. Volunteering with the full backing and support of his African-American troops wanting to lead the charge against the Confederate fortification. We will lead the way. We want to be in the forefront. We want to prove ourselves in battle. And Colonel Shaw and so many of the troops lost their lives in that, in that assault. So vividly depicted in the movie Glory. Shaw's legacy lives on, but I sometimes think if Shaw had lived, how our understanding of the burning of Darien in the years following the burning might have been drastically changed. It's interesting to reflect on what might have been. Thank you for coming. Thank you. particularly on the, the, the march into Pennsylvania where southern forces uh, and I'm assuming because the McIntosh County guards from Darien participated in the Battle of Gettysburg had gotten word of the burning of their town and they may have had some reciprocal action. I've heard stories or uh, I've seen newspaper articles, contemporary accounts to that effect, but nothing on the scale of the burning of Darien. In the back. Uh, yeah, uh, my uh, two parts. Uh, Montgomery, similar to his question about the burning of Darien and concerning himself and his hometown with the burning. And the second part is what role do you think it played with the, uh, the other troops in the Grant House not burning? Okay, good question, Griffin. Uh, I agree. Montgomery, as I have alluded to in my talk, had already seen a lot of a, a lot of terrible destruction in Kansas and it suffered badly at the hands of the, 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 the vile abolitionist fights out there against the ones that wanted to make Kansas a slaveholding state. So he did have passions. He had prejudices. And I'm sure that rationale entered to him into his thinking when he was so bent on burning dairy. The second part of your question about the present day Grant House that house was built in the 1840s by a man named Woodford Mabry, a white man 
who was the customs pork collector for the Port of Brunswick and Darien. And of course, in the 1850s, Darien was a port of more consequence than Brunswick was, so he had his home in Darien. And he was also reportedly a very strong Union sympathizer. He was not in Darien when the town was burned, but he was a, known to be a Union supporter and sympathizer, and word had gotten to Montgomery about that, and the orders were to spare that house. So that's why the Mabry Grant House stands today. Okay, next. What do we know about Hunter's orders, the specifics of Hunter's orders before they were amended, say five days before the murder? Hunter's orders, originally to Montgomery, as I elucidated in my paper, were to the effect, burn the town, destroy it. This is going to be a message to the rest of the South as to the futility of continuing the war. So there was such an order? There was an order originally, and Hunter amended his orders and changed them before the troops left. And Hunter and Montgomery carried out the original orders anyway, even though he had orders in writing, do not destroy the town, do not steal people's personal belongings, etc. Yes. Yeah. I know that uh, Shaw died at Fort Wagner. Yeah. What about Montgomery? Did he die there also? No. Uh, Montgomery fought at Fort Wagner, but he survived the battle. And then shortly after that, he was. <laughs> yeah, isn't that ironic? That's the irony. Again, the irony of this story. Uh, but it, as I said later, he was sent back to Kansas to serve out the remainder of the war. A couple of questions. Oh, in the back. Yeah, Sherman stopped before he got to Savannah, didn't he? Yes, he did. Sherman stopped at Pooler Station on the outskirts, on the western outskirts of, of Savannah. And he was met at Pooler Station on the 18th of December, 1864, by a delegation of civic officials from Savannah, in essence, imploring Sherman not to destroy the city, as he had pretty much done to Atlanta. And Sherman said, okay, I'll do this if you do not defend it, if you will not molest my troops, if you will not attack my troops. And so the Savannah officials ordered the Confederate defending forces under General Hardy to cross the river, into South Carolina because they were going to surrender the city without a fight. And so that's why Savannah was spared. The, the, and, and as far as Sherman goes, Sherman had raids outlying from his main advance to Savannah into Bryan County and Liberty County, but never into McIntosh and certainly nowhere near Derry. There was a skirmish between Sherman's forces in December of 1864, and a small contingent of Confederate troops up the Altamaha River near present Jessup, a place called Doctor Town. You may have heard about it, some of you Civil War experts, the Battle of Doctor Town. That was a, an element of Sherman's army. That's the closest they ever got to Darien. 